All right, I think we're live. Uh, Komal, I don't know if you want to start. Sure, no problem. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As we, on this lovely Wednesday morning, um, we will be talking about IFRS 17 today, uh, primarily the impact that it has on the credit ratings analysis that we do here at DBRS Morningstar for our insurance rating companies. Uh, so before I go any further, I'd like to first introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Komal Rizvi. I've been at DBRS Morningstar for more than seven years now. Uh, during my time here, I have covered a wide range of insurance companies. So uh, PNC companies, uh, life insurance companies, as well as mortgage insurance companies. Um, and before I go any further, I'd like to give my colleague, uh, uh, who will be presenting along with me, an opportunity to introduce himself. Uh, right. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Patrick Duville. I'm also a vice president at DBRS Morningstar covering the insurance sector. Um, happy to welcome everybody on to our IFRS 17 webinar. Uh, prior to DBRS Morningstar, I was an actuary in the insurance uh, industry for over 10 years here in Canada in the life insurance sector. And so I've been uh, following IFRS 17 for multiple years now so i'm very excited to finally um soon look at uh insurance results under the new standard i know that many people in the industry have worked very hard for uh to, to get to this uh transition and therefore you know i'm looking i'm looking forward as an analyst to uh, to really um have this new look at uh the financial performance of insurers all right thank you patrick uh, so moving on to IFRS 17 itself. So as you know, IFRS 17 is a really large, really complicated topic. We obviously can't cover everything about it. Uh, so the focus today will be primarily on the implications that IFRS 17 will have on our global insurance methodology. Uh, more specifically, we'll focus on some of the key metrics that will be impacted. So we'll be focusing on leverage, uh, return on equity, and capital impact. Uh, we will also be focusing on other anticipated impacts, uh, just a brief discussion on that. Uh, and following the presentation, we will be having a question and answer period. Uh, so please feel free to type any questions that you may have um, in the box on the right, um, and we will be happy to answer them at the end of the end of the talk. All right, so um, what is IFRS 17? Um, so in a nutshell, just to put it like really simply, it is a new global accounting standard for insurance contracts that is intended to replace the old IFRS 4. Um, and IFRS 17 came into force in January of this year, so just um, very recently. Uh, and the purpose of this is to just like harmonize and improve the reporting of insurance contracts um, because sometimes it it can be like quite complicated. So it's uh, meant to just, you know, uh, you know, help investors, help people read that among other items. So Canada, here in Canada, the EU, uh, the UK have all adopted IFRS 17. Uh, most notably, uh, the US has not, uh, will not, they will continue reporting under their local gap. Uh, and IFRS 17 um, does, um, you know, uh, does impact like all insurance companies. However, the impact will be uh, more for those companies that are issuing longer term insurance contracts. So we'll just, uh, and even those life goals that do have um, other businesses, those other businesses might not necessarily be impacted to the same extent that their traditional life insurance uh, business uh, will be impacted. All right, so just to put it simply, All right, so I'd just first like to start off by saying that uh, we're not anticipating any rating changes due to IFRS. So I just want to make it clear that the ratings that we currently have in our portfolio of insurance companies, we will not change as a result of IFRS 17. Uh, they might change due to other factors, but uh, not due to the accounting change. And part of the reason is because uh, we are viewing IFRS 17 as an accounting change. So in our opinion, uh, the underlying fundamental credit quality of an insurer 
has not changed. So that would not warrant um, any rating changes overall. Uh, so just as a bit of a background for those of you um, that might be unfamiliar, uh, when DBRS Morningstar rates insurance companies, uh, we utilize our global insurance methodology. So it's one, uh, one insurance methodology that is applicable to insurers in different jurisdictions, different types of insurers. And what we do is we use a building block approach. So we have five building blocks um, called franchise strength, risk profile, earnings ability, liquidity, and capitalization that you can see in the exhibit on this page. And uh, most of these building, and what we do is we take these building blocks, assess and insure under each one, and then we combine the results of the building blocks, uh, do a peer analysis, other items, and we come up with an overall rating for our company. So under IFRS, um, the factors and the sub factors underneath the building blocks are mostly expected to remain the same, especially for franchise strength, um, for risk profile, and for liquidity, those will not be expected to change. Um, and the reason for that is that so far we have not seen any indications that um, insurers are planning to change their you know, business strategies, their business plans, their product mix, invested asset mix um, because of IRFRS 17. So this may change in the future, um, you know, as companies, you know, uh, as companies find out that IFRS 17 may encourage or discourage certain uh, certain behaviors. So, but as of currently, um, uh, we have not seen any indications yet. So those building blocks will remain the same. However, um, because IFRS 17 does impact the reporting of, um, does impact the reporting and the financial statements, and we do derive a lot of our information from the financial statements, it will have an impact on how we assess the earnings ability building block and the capitalization building blocks. Uh, so, uh, so while we may not make any rating changes, um, I would not like to shut the door on any rating, cha rating changes to the methodology in the future. And that would be, um, you know, we can't just change it, uh, you know, without having a good amount of like credible data. So we need like uh, credible data over like a few time periods and, you know, really be confident that any changes we would want to make are fully, completely justified. Uh, so we're not shutting the door on that, but um, if you do make any changes, um, they will be communicated um, formally. Uh, we do update our methodology once a year. So the 2023 update will go on, uh, will happen later this year. And if there are any changes that we wish to make, um, uh, we do put out a request for comments or stakeholders are able to uh, you know, provide their input, um, but uh, it will be like communicated like formally. It, it wouldn't be any surprises. Uh, so Patrick, I just like to I just like to ask um, Patrick, um, uh, would you like to describe any circumstances that may in fact warrant any methodology changes like down the road? Sure. Um... So let me just start by saying that we're confident that our current methodology give us the flexibility to accurately rate insurance companies uh, after the transition to IFRS 17. We generally take a long-term through cycle view of the credit quality of an issuer, and we use uh, professional judgment and analytical expertise to interpret the financial results like already under multiple accounting basis across the world, including uh, under IFRS 4 that's still allows you know various large variety of, of accounting practices for insurance contracts that being said ifrs 17 will bring in new metrics such as the csm the contractual service margin um, the insurance service result as well as the the investment result and these new metrics uh, will provide us new information and over time, as we have data on these metrics, we will consider whether they need to take a more central role in our uh, approach to rating insurance companies. IFRS 17 will also change some 
metrics that we currently use. Um, earnings, obviously, leverage ratios, interest coverage ratios, ROE are expected to be affected by FRS 17. However, it's still too early for us to to say whether these need to be recalibrated because of IFRS 17. Um, keep in mind, our methodology relies on a long-term view of some of these metrics, and therefore we don't expect that the transition, even if there are um, movements in these metrics, that it will have a material immediate impact on um, the ratings. And therefore, this gives us time to look at the data and look at whether there needs to be a recalibration in the future. All right. Um, thank you, Patrick. That was a, a good summary. All right. So moving on to um, the changes themselves. So one of the major changes uh, resulting from IFRS 17 is a creation of a new liability called the contractual service margin or the CSM, as Patrick uh, mentioned. And the CSM represents future profits that will be recognized as earnings through the life of the insurance contract. Uh, so on the right here, I have a representative balance sheet um, that kind of shows the difference as we move from IFRS 4 to IFRS 17. Now this uh, example I'd like to rate is just um, a sample. It's meant to be a Canadian balance sheet, uh, as you can see. I have mentioned like PFADs in here, other jurisdictions um, uh, uh, do things differently. Um, and uh, the, the proportions here are not meant to be for, meant to be at scale. So just to keep that in mind, and you know, the balance sheet impact for different companies will be different. Um, uh, and the impact can just like vary like quite a bit from company to company as well, depending on their product mix, depending on, you know, what their business looks like. Uh, but just as uh, a general example, uh, here we see that uh, the CSM is created. And the other main point is that equity uh, declines. So we can see that the equity on the second bar is smaller than the equity under IFRS 4 in, in Canada. Um, so what happens then is that because there is like a decline in short shareholders equity, it does affect the metrics that we use that involve uh, common equity. So two of the main ones are leverage um, because, um, you know, it has uh, equity in the denominator. Um, same with the return on equity ROE, which also has um, equity in the denominator and then obviously we see we will see an increase in both metrics. Now for ROE, that is positive because you know it goes up, it's better, uh, while for leverage, the impact will be negative because it will um, increase as well. Um, so it's important to note that not all companies will experience a decline in equity. This is kind of just based on you know guidance we've received, information so far, but um, you know, no real data has come out. We don't have Q1 2023 numbers yet, so we don't can't really gauge the true impact. But <coughs> in general, I think we can expect equity for life goes to um, either remain the same or decrease. And then the impact on leverage and ROE is also uh, something that we can expect on a general basis. Uh, Patrick, do you have anything to add on this slide? I think I would just reiterate that there are a lot of different accounting practices and a lot of different products sold across the global industry right now. So this is really an illustration for, you know, a typical Canadian life insurance company where a lot of our focus is on for this, this transition, but that in fact, you know, if you're a PNC insurer, you might not have a lot of balance sheet um, movements and, um, also, I, I would point out that IFRS 9 is also being adopted at the same time for insurance companies. Um, and therefore, that will affect asset uh, valuations uh, on, the, on the asset side of the balance sheet. So again, this, this picture is a lot more complex in reality, but um, we've tried to focus on where there's the greater impacts uh, from a balance sheet perspective. 
All right, so delving a little bit deeper into um, some of the metrics. Uh, so I'll talk about ROE first. Uh, so DBR's Morningstar will continue to use reported equity for its ROE calculation. So its ROE calculation will remain the same that it always has been. Uh, we'll be using reported numbers. So reported net income and reported equity as on the uh, balance sheet. And again, I'd like to say that, um, you know, if, if data comes out that warrants a change, we may make a change. Uh, but as of right now, we will be continuing, we will not make changes to the way we uh, assess ROE. Uh, and just a point for uh, those that might not be familiar as familiar with our methodology. So the ROE calculation that we do use um, in our global insurance methodology is a three-year weighted average. So for example, for um, uh, this year, we will be using year-end 2020, 2021, and 2022 numbers. So really for companies that are going to uh, go for the annual review this cycle, they will not be an impact um, because of IFRS 17. Uh, now this might change in the future um, as ROE values might uh, change after IFRS 17. However, because this is kind of like, we do take like a weighted average approach, it does kind of smooth out a lot of the impacts. Uh, so it might not be as much as expected. Um, and just uh, based on what we kind of expect for ROE, we are expecting companies, uh, most life insurers ROEs to increase um, to varying degrees. So some might remain the same, some might increase uh, materially. Uh, right now, we just like don't have enough information uh, to gauge this. Um, uh, Patrick, if you could just um, explain a little bit more about our rationale for um, keeping ROE as is. Sure. Um, so the the main sort of consideration we've had on on ROE is whether or not the CSM um, should be considered as equity, and it's really the same uh, consideration that we would have for the calculation of the leverage ratio. And that one has been the, a bit more um, controversial. Um, and I know we'll we'll be uh, talking about it later. So um, I won't, you know, spend too much time right now on CSM being included in equity, but um, there's a bit of a natural offset in between those two impacts with the leverage ratio sort of uh, going up, but also same thing with ROE and that, that in our methodology, um, just results in in lesser overall ratings impact, given that they go in opposite directions. All right, so just moving on to leverage, um, as Patrick was just referring to. Um, so, uh, so we have made the decision uh, to not include the CSM as capital in our leverage calculation. Uh, so currently, our leverage cal is calculated as debt plus preferred shares plus hybrid over total capital of which common equity is a portion. Um, so we may expect some, you know, some increases to leverage. Now we have even less uh, information on how leverage will change um, as compared to ROE. So it's really too early to assess how companies will be impacted. Uh, that said, we are cognizant of, you know, the transition impacts and we will factor that into our assessment when we look at a company's leverage. Uh, right now, ranges are relatively broad, so you know, it does not necessarily mean a company will just automatically uh, be rated poorly because their leverage goes up. We do take a more holistic view, and uh, there are many components to how we assess uh, capital. And again, like once we have more, once we have more data, more credible data, we will we might revisit the leverage sub factor. Um, as necessary. So uh, we haven't shut the door on that. But as of right now, we we have made the decision to not include the CSM as capital. Um, and I know, Patrick, this is a very like interesting point. So if you could just elaborate a little bit more, uh, the rationale behind our decision to not include CSM as capital. Sure. So yeah, we've had a lot of discussions internally about this. 
Um, same thing with uh, our issuers as well. We recognize that some companies will include CSM as part of equity for the calculation of uh, how they report leverage ratios and that it may be what makes the most sense for them uh, from their individual company perspective. However, we have a global insurance methodology which is applied across sectors and across jurisdictions and as much as possible, we try not to make any adjustments to reported values in order to not introduce any biases towards certain accounting regimes um, in, our, in our methodology. In this case, CSM is defined as a liability in the IFRS accounting regime. And even though it can be thought of as future profit, um, it's not guaranteed to be earned. There are non-provision expenses that will be incurred for that uh, CSM to be earned over time. And therefore it's we couldn't really say it's the same thing as, as common equity. We thought about maybe doing a portion of it, um, but that really opened a can of worms in terms of the, the data that uh, we would require from, from each insurer in order to, to calculate it. And again, just sort of complexity around, you know, the calculation of that proportion of CSM that we could we'd consider for as equity for the purpose of the leverage ratio. Um, and the last point maybe on this is that uh, in Canada, the regulatory capital regime will include CSM as part of available capital for life insurers in particular. And um, while that is a, an important context for, for Canadian life insurers, it is, it is unique to, to Canada in a sense and the account, the capital regime in Canada has a, a more broad definition of capital compared to what we're trying to measure with, with our leverage ratio. All right, um, so uh, Patrick touched a little bit on this. Um, so I'll move on to regulatory capital. So that portion of our assessment of an insurer's capitalization. Uh, so regulatory capital will continue to remain very important in our assessment of an insurer's financial strength. Um, so what we do in our methodology is um, we really look at how a company fares under the regulatory capital regime of whatever jurisdiction that it is domiciled in. So for Canadian life codes, it would be LICAT. For uh, non-life insurers, it would be PNC. Um, I mean, it would be MCT, and in Europe, it would be Solvency II, for example. Uh, so as Patrick mentioned, um, OSFI, uh, Canada's regulatory body, OSFI, um, has decided to count a CSM as Tier 1 available capital under LICAD. Um, and in general, uh, we can expect the LICAD ratio for most insurers to either you know, remain the same or, you know, even increase significantly. It kind of just depends on uh, the, the characteristics of the insurer themselves. Um, and, you know, like many other factors, like the reserve, current reserving practices, et cetera. So um, it can really like vary like quite a bit. And um, again, like currently we do not have this information yet, but this is, you know, like kind of like our best estimate of what is going to happen. Um, for non-life insurers in Canada, the MCT uh, is, is expected to either remain the same or like decrease slightly. So it's kind of like the opposite of what is expected to happen for a Canadian life goes. And, and as Patrick touched upon, uh, Solvency II uh, in Europe will not be affected by IFRS 17. And that is because they do not rely on the uh, accounting financial statements um, in their regulatory regime. Um, we will continue to use regulatory capital ratios as reported in our assessment of capital. We do like to align with the, uh, with the regulatory bodies as much as possible. Um, and um, for us, like we do look favorably upon companies that maintain, you know, sizable buffer above the, above their regulatory minimums. Uh, and that is something that is not expected to change um, 
as a result of IFRS 17. So, um, so one thing that is a little bit uncertain about, um, you know, the impact of IFRS 17 under LICAT is uh, we don't yet know how um, how volatile LICAT will be under IFRS 17. Uh, so since LICAT was implemented a few years back, it has remained, you know, remarkably stable, um, even though, you know, since we've seen periods of like high volatility, we've seen, you know, um, one, in a one, year, one in a hundred year events, we've seen, you know, lots of things, but the LICAT ratio for most companies has remained quite stable. Now, whether that will remain true under LICAT, um, I expect it to, like we kind of expect it to remain stable, continue exhibiting the stability. However, um, we can factor out, you know, any interactions that uh, are not vis visible to us um, at the moment. Um, so just touching a little bit on that, uh, uh, Patrick, um, there, if there are uh, large movements in the capital ratios, um, how would we consider that in our analysis? So, as the Komal mentioned, we, we don't have an internal capital model, so we rely on regulatory capital um, and other metrics, but it's, it's one of the important metrics for our assessment of an insurer's capital position. And um, in Canada, because of the link between the regulatory regime and the accounting balance sheet, um, there will be movements in capital ratios because of IFRS 17. Now the good the good news is that this was um, foreseen in some ways, and in fact, even the LICAT uh, framework I remember was was designed originally to coincide with the uh, the transition to IFRS 17. Now there was a bit of a delay with IFRS 17, so so it took five more years um, for for it to to go live. But um, ultimately, the LICAT regime was designed to work with IFRS 17, so I think it will actually introduce more stability in the ratio and fix some of the glitches that that we've seen in recent years. Um, when it comes to the large impacts, again, I think some of those were were expected. And in fact, some of these were also disclosed by by the mainly by life insurers here in Canada, which means that we were able to start considering these um, these impacts in our assessment of capital um, you know, almost a year back from now. So again, keeping in, in line with our long-term um, stable view of, of the ratings and the fact that we are quite, um, let's say, happy with the level of capital in the industry in Canada, we don't really see any issues. And in fact, the conversation becomes more about what's going to be the new expectations now that the transition and the uncertainty around the transition is over, what will be the new expectations in, in terms of how much capital insurers are expected to maintain and whether or not uh, some that see maybe a, a big increase in their ratio will have substantial excess capital that they will have to put to use. So I think, if anything, the conversation and the thinking around the analysis will be more around those, those potential surpluses that will emerge um, rather than any issues with the capitalization uh, of, of uh, individual insurers. Right. Um, so a lot of our discussion right now has been focused on uh, LICAD. Um, I mean, we are based um, in Canada and um, IFRS 17 is impacting life goals. But uh, Patrick, if you could just touch uh, a bit briefly on uh, any impact that IFRS 17 can have on non-life insurers or those in Europe that are following uh, the Solvency 2 rules, just on a really high level basis. Yeah, I mean, there's there's not too much to say. I can talk a bit about the non-life insurers here in Canada, which are seeing some um, regulatory change, uh, a bit more punitive, in, in fact. So we expect a small maybe decrease or, or, or stability for non-life insurers um, and a mortgage insurer as well. So expected to be negatively affected by the transition in terms of capital. Um, in, in Outside of Canada, because there's not the same linkage between the accounting and the, and the sort of regulatory frameworks for capital, 
there's really nothing to, to say in terms of capital impacts, right? Um, unless really a, an insurer decides to change their strategy around funding and, and their capital position because of the the accounting changes, but that will take time to happen and we'll react to those. If those strategic decisions are made, we'll, we'll react then. Uh, but on the transition itself, there's nothing really, really to, to see. All right. Um, so, so far we've touched on like some of the key metrics that will be impacted. Um, we'd also like to spend a bit of time just talking about income volatility under IFRS 17. Uh, and the reason why I um, mentioned this is because in our assessment of earnings ability, uh, while we look at ROE, all those other factors, we also uh, look at the stability of earnings. So a company that has demonstrated stable earnings year over year, we would look at it uh, more favorably than a company that, you know, has a really big profits um, one year and like negative uh, and losses the next year. Uh, just because it kind of tells us that a company is like managing their business well. Um, so regarding the impact of IFRS 17 on income volatility, so uh, there does appear to be like a bit of like conflicting information out there. Uh, so what, from what we can tell, um, underlying insurance earnings or what some people call core insurance earnings, which essentially have like one-time impacts or you know, volatility impacts kind of like stripped out so they're smooth. Um, so those we can expect to remain stable. Uh, where there's less clarity is like the impact on reported net income. So looking at, you know, global life goals and what they have stated, um, while some expect earning reported net income to be more stable, uh, there are some that are expecting the earnings to be more volatile. And really, until we have, uh, you know, more data going forward, um, it's really kind of hard for us to like gauge whether uh, it's really hard for us to like really gauge like the impact of IFRS 17 on reported net income. And reporting that income is important to us because we do use it in a number of metrics in our methodology. Uh, so that being said, when um, analyzed earnings, DBRS does take into consideration, um, you know, like one-time impacts that may affect um, earnings uh, stability. So um, there is like quite a fair bit of judgment that we can apply. Um, and we just try to assess, you know, are earnings sustainable? If a company has really strong earnings, will we expect that to continue? Or if there's a company that has experienced uh, large amounts of unrealized losses, this is just an example uh, that has that has resulted from like you know one time uh, one time factor like beyond their control, then we're not necessarily going to uh, penalize the company for that. So uh, when analyzing income volatility, we really tend to look have like a more holistic view, and there can be quite a a uh, bit of judgment um, thrown in here. Um, that being said, um, this is kind of like an interesting topic. Um, so Patrick, can you uh, touch on some of the ways that issuers may try to reduce their volatility of earnings and our view on this topic? Sure, and I'll, I'll keep it short just so we have uh, enough time for Q&A. Yeah. But um, uh, for S17, I think we'll uh, first, on the insurance performance, will smooth out earnings through the introduction of the CSM and the ability of um, large assumption changes to be offset by by changes in the CSM. So we'll actually see more stable insurance earnings. On the investment side, um, there might be different treatments used by different companies, um, whether or not the interest rate impacts will be put through OCI or not. So we'll have to be a bit more careful about looking at uh, OCI numbers and making sure that we are comparing apples to apples between companies that may use different uh, accounting practices. Um, I think though the, the main point is that, you know, compared to now where we have so many different practices across all the countries that use IFRS 4, now we'll have a more consistent language globally, which I think will be a large improvement for insurers to tell sort of their story 
I think the separation of the insurance result versus the, the investment result as well will be will be quite useful and in understanding the performance of insurers. There's going to be noise. There are still glitches and 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 um, you know, I think especially if you run a really long term business, there might be noise in the short term in your earnings on the investment side that that obfuscate a bit the, the story, but overall, I still see it as an improvement in terms of at least, you know, as, as a financial analyst covering global insurance sector, um, I think it will be an improvement in terms of comparability and, um, and it will be our job to look through some of the noise, assess whether, you know, movements in CSM, um, earnings and OCI, how all of these pieces fit together in, in telling the story of uh, the financial performance of an insurer. All right, um, moving on to our last slide before we move on to uh, the Q&A. Uh, so I'd just like to summarize that, you know, the impact of IFRS 17 will vary by issuer. Um, so we do have a pretty like wide and diverse portfolio of insurance credits. So LifeCo's uh, uh, comprise a significant portion of it, but we do have, you know, non-life and um, other types of insurance businesses. So the impact on the traditional life goals is high, but for example, for group life, for group insurance and for PNC, the impact is low. While any other ancillary businesses that uh, insurers have, such as asset and wealth management, any service oriented businesses, other fee based businesses that are non insurance in nature, uh, they will not be impacted by IFRS 17. Uh, and just like a last point to make is that you know, even with the traditional life insurance companies, you know, over the past decade or so, or even longer than that, we have seen them, you know, diversify away from their uh, traditional life, the really capital intensive long term businesses away, uh, away from that uh, until like now they they're comprising a smaller and smaller portion. So even the impact on, you know, a large global life goal, for example, will be much less today resulting from IFRS 17 than it would have been, for example, if IFRS 17 had been impacted, let's say like 15 years ago. Um, so with that, um, I would like to conclude the presentation portion and move on uh, to the Q&A. So I see we have a few questions uh, here already. Um, I'd like to give everyone like a minute, minute or two to um, write any, uh, enter any additional questions they may have. And until then, I'd just like to ask Patrick, um, um, like, what are we seeing globally so far in terms of the impact of IFRS 17? And what can we expect in, to the best of your knowledge? And uh, what can we expect for Q1 2023 results? So, you know, I remember going through the development of IFRS 17, there were a lot of uh, ap apocalyptic uh, predictions uh, in terms of volatility or impact, especially with insurers with long-term business. And I think the fact that it took so long for the standard to come in has really allowed insurers to prepare well for it. Uh, and now from what we hear, it seems that um, actually the volatility and earnings might be less. Uh, and again, it depends what your current accounting regime is, because IFRS 4 allows for so many different practices. But um, but in a lot of ways, it seems that the insurers now have um, adapted and uh, positioned themselves to report stable earnings, and uh, with uh, yes, some impact on negative impact on their on their equity on transition, uh, but sort of I would say manageable impacts, and overall to hopefully um, tell a, a, a clearer story about their financial performance in the future. Uh, I think something else that's been um, good in some ways is the steep rise in interest rates that we've seen across the, 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 the world um, over the last year. Um, I think that in general, and, and there are unique circumstances, but in general, higher rates is, is beneficial for insurance companies and under IFRS 17, especially that that uh, benefit might be more apparent again, you know, depending on, on what you were doing before. But but in general, I think insurers are, are quite well positioned with the higher interest rates and with the changes they've made to their business model or their products uh, to to transition. 
Um, perfect. Um, okay, so we do have a few questions. So I'll start with um, I'll start with one of them. Um, so the question is, how will rating changes impact earnings for life goals under IFRS seventeen? Um, rating changes. So again, just to reiterate, re reiterate, we don't expect rating changes. Um, if if you're, and how would they affect earnings? I mean, ratings on the insurance uh, company's portfolio might affect their earnings, uh, but again, they wouldn't insurance the insurance sector wouldn't necessarily be a large enough proportion of their portfolio to have like earnings impact if if ratings were to change so there's not really okay. uh, an impact from rating changes to earnings yeah so yeah the question is slightly unclear at least to me but yes we are not making any uh changes to the ratings as a result of ifrs 17. um in terms of like the, in the earnings impact like our assessment of their earnings um i think we mentioned like the ROA might go up, um, but this year, um, because of like the way we calculate ROA, um, we do not expect companies to, you know, fare poorly under our methodology because of IFRS 17. Um, so a question um, for, uh, so another question, I think we slightly touched on that before, but it's, would you see an impact in US-based life goals due to IFRS 17 impl implementation, like the way they would impact Canadian life goals? So, Yeah, if um, US companies were to implement IFRS 17, it would certainly have a very big impact, I think, on balance sheets there, equity evaluations. It's, it's quite different what they do in the US for, for accounting. Um, there are big accounting changes, not the same as IFRS 17, but going in a similar direction in some ways. So there are big accounting changes um, in the US as well. I think the goal will be that over time, the presentation and, and the practices harmonize, even though I doubt that it's ever gonna be the same. Um, but yes, there are big impacts there. In the US, the, the, there's a statutory regime that is separated from accounting. So again, there's there's a lot of moving pieces when you look at financial results of insurers in the US um, and there's a lot of changes for them as well, but that's a whole, that's a whole other topic. Okay. Uh, so this is an interesting question. Um, something we've thought about um, it's were life goals overcapitalized in the past with regulators erring on the side of conservatism in setting capital levels. Um, the, I, I think you could say yes that regulators were conservative. I think there was also again some more dire predictions from the industry on on what would happen, and that uh, maybe pushed regulators to be able to to ask for more capital to be set up in, in, before the transition. Now, keep in mind also, you know, th three years ago, interest rates were were at rock bottom, maybe even negative throughout all these. Um, conversations around 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 capital and the transition to IFRS 17. So we're quite in a different world in a way now um, than we were when when those conversations were happening. So I think it's a combination of all these things that uh, might produce large surpluses. And I think going forward, the interesting conversation will be well, what's the expectation now um, if like uh, ratios are more stable and um, you know, there's not there's not the the uncertainty around the transition to IFRS 17 anymore. Does that mean that you can operate at a lower level? Right. Yeah, and just like important to say, like we can't speak um, on behalf of the regulator. Like we don't know like their thought process. Um, but like I'm comfortable in saying that you know we do think the Canadian life insurance company in particular is like quite and just the insurance uh, industry in general in Canada is like quite well capitalized. So. Um, so we don't have any concerns like um, on that level. Uh, so any uh, so another question that kind of refers to OSFI, um, I can ask this, but I don't think we have a good answer for this, but any idea on the rationale for OSFI to include CSM in capital uh, for life, but not PNC? I mean, I can sort of give uh, my, my thoughts on this. I think LICAT was redesigned really with IFRS 17 in mind and if you look at um, the calculation of LICAT, it includes more um, 
both on the buffer side and on the available side, um, it includes more, um, you know, compared to what we had before, the MCCSR that was really just, you know, how much capital you have over your liabilities. LICAT actually includes some of the the risk, um, the PFADs or the risk adjustment liabilities, for instance, are considered capital. So it's quite more permissive and the buffer is also larger to replicate that. And that's why you end up with a, you know, a target ratio that's also lower on the LICAT side compared to MCT. So I think maybe they just haven't gotten around to to redesigning MCT for, for IFRS 17 the way they, they did LICAT for um, for life codes. So that that's probably the, the reason. All right. Um, so uh, another question is, um, will DBRS be sharing their definition of underlying earnings or is that a measure that we will be looking at? Yeah, for earnings, we really have to look at a lot of different things. I mean, our methodology is is, um, is quite high level when it comes to looking at earnings or earnings volatility, because uh, if you think about it, we have multiple accounting regimes across the world. We've got OCI, now we'll have CSM. Um, we've got shareholder versus par earnings. We've got core earnings, adjusted earnings, underlying earnings that are measures that are used by the various um, uh, players in the industry. So there's really a, a collection of, of measures for us to look at to try to ev evaluate profitability. And um, and that's going to be the case still under IFRS 17. So no, we won't have a clear definition of, of underlying earnings because um, that's not something we can apply to every company consistently. We really have to look at at different metrics for for different insurers. Right, and like uh, I just like to add that we do like to you know use um, uh, values that are reported um, rather than you know our own measures, uh, just because it kind of just enhances comparability. And as Patrick mentioned, they, um, you know, underlying earnings, a definition um, is different from company to company. So we do like to be, we like our approach to be, you know, balanced and fair and, um, and just like use reported um, values as necessary. Now we may address like if necessary on rare occasions, but that is not like the standard approach that we take. Um, okay, so we're a bit over time. I uh, just have one last question. Um, it talks about, are they going to be rating changes to the investment portfolio? Um, yeah, I've touched, yeah, I've touched on it briefly earlier when right. it was the earnings impact of rating changes. I mean, we don't expect rating changes at all. So um, really, no, there won't be rating changes to the investment portfolio because IFRS 17 only affects insurance companies and insurance companies are only a small portion of the portfolio. And in any way, we don't expect rating impacts to um, to affect the insurance sector um, from, from IFRS 17. So no, no impact on the portfolio. Yeah, there will only, I just like to add that there will only be changes to an insurer's investment portfolio if they decided to change the makeup like themselves. So, um, you know, go into low rated bonds or anything of that nature. But like on our end, we will, we're not making rating changes. Um, all right, so I, I don't see any more questions and we're a little bit over time, but uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, this was a good talk, I uh, had some good questions. Uh, thank you to my colleague Patrick as well for answering all those questions. Um, and yeah, this concludes the presentation. Um, have a great day. Thank you.